Welcome to IDEA to IPO. Hello, I'm Jennifer. IDEA to IPO has been holding tech startup events in Silicon Valley for many, many years. We organize venture capital panels, legal workshops, networking events, and more. These days, we are 100% online. We hold an event nearly every day of the week. Check out our schedule at idea2ipo.com. At this point, I'm going to hand it off to our distinguished moderator, Roger Royce. Roger, take it away. Hey, thanks very much, Jennifer, for that introduction. I'm Roger Royce. I'm a partner with the law firm of Haynes and Boone, resident in Palo Alto, California, the Silicon Valley office. And I'm here to moderate today's panel on uh, energy technology, energy tech. So before we get started, I do wanna go over a few housekeeping items. And I see we still have people joining, attendees are joining, go ahead and, and log in. We're, we're, we'll get started in a minute. But before we do, I wanna thank ID to IPO for hosting and sponsoring or hosting this event rather, uh, and uh, my law firm Haynes and Boone for sponsoring. So we will have a panel discussion for one hour. We're at noon Pacific time here in California. We'll go to one o'clock Pacific and then we have 30 minutes for Q&A. So save up your questions and go ahead and post them in the Q&A box, not the chat box, but the Q&A box and we'll get to them at the end of the hour. You'll notice that we do have a chat feature. Uh, the chat feature is should be enabled so that you can speak to everybody. So think of that as your virtual business card. If you wanna exchange messages, post your information, let people know who you are. I'm going to put my LinkedIn uh, profile up in that chat box here in a minute. Uh, and the rest of you can certainly do the same. Um, this is being recorded. You can watch a recording of this on the Idea to IPO YouTube channel. You can also see it on my personal YouTube channel, Roger Royce Law. Uh, and you'll get a link to the recording at the conclusion or after the panel is concluded. If you're tweeting uh, to Twitter, tweet uh, hashtag idea to IPO uh, and make sure that uh, you join our mailing list. So again, our agenda is a panel discussion uh, followed by Q&A and we're going to be talking today about the topic of energy technology, energy tech, investment in new technologies. It's oftentimes called climate tech. It used to be called clean tech. We don't use that word anymore. Uh, but we've seen, certainly I've seen a, a real resurgence in the area over the last couple of years. It's really a big thing. It's a big deal. And we've got a panel of experts here to talk about that. Before we get started, the last thing I wanna do I was going to do a poll, but I'm not going to do a poll. Looks like it's not loaded. So I think I'm going to go right to the panel. So I'm putting you all on gallery view. And uh, the first thing uh, I think I'd like to do is maybe ask our panelists to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about who they are and how they come to the space. And Sarah, since you're the closest to me on my screen, I think I'll start with you. Sounds great. Thanks for having me. It's good to be back here. My name is Sarah Chamberlain. I'm a co-founder and managing director with Energy Foundry. And we are an early stage venture fund based in Chicago. Um, we focus exclusively on, and we do use the word clean tech. We're still, uh, we're old school, I guess now. Um, but power and electrification is our sweet spot, our two limited partners or strategic partners are the utilities here, ComEd, which is part of Exelon and Ameren. And so we like to focus on things that are aligned with those types of businesses, which does allow us a lot of degrees of freedom, certainly, but we try to focus on the core. Uh, we write checks of around half a million bucks to start, and then we reserve follow-on behind all of our investments, usually up to about two and a half million into a company. Um, we're about nine years in and our fund is structured as an evergreen fund. So um, in, a, in a typical fund, we'd be sort of on our last legs harvesting the portfolio. But because of this evergreen structure, we're making investments. We've had multiple exits. So as that capital comes back in, we can redeploy it into other businesses. So that gives us a lot more flexibility to make investments in early stage companies um, and in companies that are gonna take a little bit more time to build out their businesses. Um, 
And in the, you know, five years ago, we would say we're doing seed and series A. Now it's more like pre-seed and seed, given the amount of capital and interest that's flowing back into this sector. So I'll pause there. I'm sure we'll get to all these topics in the discussion. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Uh, Vitelli, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yes, thanks for having me, Roger, and, and everybody else. Uh, uh, I've been on the uh, on this series before live <laughs> back in the before COVID days, and um, I lead the mobility practice and mobility and energy transition practice at Drake Star Partners, which is a leading investment bank. Uh, we are the leaders in the category of mobility and energy transition um, in North America and Europe, and we've done a lot of the reference deals in electric charging, um, as well as of course vehicles and, and things that are related to the space. Um, I'm a little bit of Benjamin Button of uh, investment banking. I ended up in investment banking instead of starting there. And uh, previously, I was a founding partner at HP Tech Ventures, the corporate venture arm of, of HP Inc. And before that, was a founder CEO, venture backed uh, for many years myself. Hey, thanks very much. Guillermo. Hey, Roger. Hey, everybody. Uh, great to meet you all. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, Roger, with you. Um, so my name is Guillermo Sierra. I have uh, been an investment banker, primarily m and energy industry, most of my career, if not my whole career. And not unlike everybody in the energy, in the traditional energy space, in the process of transforming personally and obviously with work, right? I, uh, I lead energy transition, I'm a specific energy transition for Neighbors Industries, which is the second largest driller, land driller, I guess, in the world. Um, and as you can possibly imagine, you know, the, the idea, the hope or what we're trying to accomplish is using who we are today, a highly advanced technology company that we develop, you know, software, hardware, uh, robotics, automation, assets, businesses, anything that we do to make, you know, our fleet and our assets more efficient um and 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 operate remotely and do all, all the things that we do use all of these toolkits this technology to figure out ways to expand and to invest into tangential areas where we see significant potential and disruption in the energy space um so that that's kind of where we are now and and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about kind of what we're doing as as we continue on the panel right okay and osama Yes, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Osama Idris. I work for EDF, um, which stands for Electricity de France, which is the legacy electric utility of France, which has transformed now into one of the larger power electric companies around the world with operations in the US, Europe, Asia, and South America. Uh, my role is an investment director with the corporate venture capital group. Uh, I sit in Los Altos in California and uh, lead the investment activity for, for EDF in North America, which mainly comprises of two things. We invest in funds. So as an LP uh, in certain funds where we would like to, to join them and, and support their portfolio companies. And last year, we also initiated the directly investment into startups, US-based startups. Uh, we've done that before in, in Europe for the last two or three years, but this initi initiative into US-based startups is, is fairly new. We look for series A companies uh, with a product, ideally paying customers, where we could become a partner of growth for them uh, to grow their business maybe uh, further in the US, but ideally as well into France, UK, Belgium, and Italy, where EDF is, um, is really present and, and can really lead and support their growth there. Uh, so from that perspective, we really look very wide range net from you know, um, smart home, uh, decarbonization, mobility, obviously utility services as well. So all, all sorts of things that could, could really relate to what EDF does globally. And on a personal note, I, I started in the energy industry working at Chevron, the oil and gas company for about 12 years, uh, joining their venture capital group uh, eventually, and then joined Siemens venture capital group as well for about three years and joined EDF about two years ago, two and a half years ago. And uh, so, yeah, I have mainly corporate venture capital experience over the last six, seven years. And before that was more on the operational side as an engineer and project manager. And happy happy to be here and to discuss energy tech and venture capital. 
Great. Well, thank you. Well, let's let's stay with you for a second, Osama. You have a pretty varied background. You invest in funds, you invest in startups, you do kind of corporate venture, you've done venture. Um, so, so tell me, especially now that you're getting into this market, uh, am I right? Are things different right now? Or are we, is, is energy tech just a much big, bigger thing uh, for investors than it has been in the past? And, and what are you kind of seeing big picture overall? in terms of dollars available for energy tech companies? Yeah, very, very much so. Um, you're, you're very right. I think the moment we're at right now, the amount of capital and, and different talent and the approaches of all sorts of industry to really address their carbon footprint and emissions and energy consumption and things like that is, um, I, I wasn't gonna say active in 2006, seven and eight as I am now, but I remember those days when we were looking into investments and most of them went to principal generation technologies. Uh, but the breadth now of all the different verticals, all the different approaches, whether it's agriculture, mobility, buildings, as well as generational and principal technologies, the, it, it's really unprecedented, I think. And you see it as well in not just the typical investments, but also in funds that really address, you know, hard tech or what tough tech, whatever you want to call it that has the now the lessons learned that we know it will take 15 to 20 years to to fruition but there's still capital and there's still opportunity for that so i would agree um it's quite the moment right now how, how about the rest of you do you see it the same way i just, i want to say it's it's uh it changes when when it becomes profitable and, and materially profitable to invest in this type of stuff right i mean if, if you compare it to last time around you're not going to have a new shell revolution kind of putting this aside and going and let us go with economics again. Um, not only from a capital availability standpoint for everybody, like companies, corporates, VCs, and, and LPs of those VCs and the LPs of private equity focused on ESG and making sure that the underlying investments are made with an ESG friendly focus and view. Uh, but also from the fact that at this point, a lot of these technologies. Um, we know we'll stay around, right? We know that they're successful, with, with, they're profitable without uh, subsidies necessarily. We know that there's a future for them. And we know, like, again, that hydrocarbons are not going to come become cheap again and shell's going to happen and, and, and economics are going to start driving us back to the old ways. That's just, that's, that's a foregone conclusion at this point. It's not going to happen. So we all have to adapt. Guillermo, is that what's driving the investment? Is that it's? It seems like this is now a profitable sector. I mean, you you've been pretty active lately uh, in these sorts of investments, and I, I'm curious as to why. Well, uh, you know, we we are just like any traditional energy business. If if we don't start pivoting our business today, we're gonna look ten years from now. And we're going to realize shit, we're blockbuster, right? Like there's, we we should have been making the steps a long time ago to start to start identifying those potential areas of opportunity, of tangential opportunity to our existing business, to invest in those businesses and for, for, for everybody's benefit. And Roger knows it very well. We've, invest, we've, we've been in, pretty heavily investing in a few um, kind of, you know, venture uh, uh, technologies on the geothermal space. I would call it most more unconventional geothermal energy um, and, and, and things that we believe could be put significantly disruptive things where we believe we can use the power of the corporation, right? Like we're, we are different than a VC in the sense that we, we're not just money to provide for growth, but we're trying to kind of provide the full power of the corporation to accelerate some of these guys' plans and, and provide the engineering and the R&D and the testing and the equipment and whatever it is that they need to support their, their kind of forward, fast forwarding into the future, if you will, and growth. And, and you're right, Roger. I mean, the, the idea that they're probably not gonna be profitable for a little while, uh, but you know, but if we're, not starting, if we're not starting to make these investments now, you know, we're, we're starting to, I'm, I'm, I'm worried more about five, 10 years from now than I am about the next five, if you will. Um, I think we have solid base business, but we need to use that base business now that is solid to, pl to, to support and platform support um, disruptive technologies of the future. Any other comments from our other panelists? Yeah, I would add that um, I think 
we're seeing an, an interesting transition. Uh, the younger generations coming of age and, and getting into power positions to make decisions and is a lot more aware of uh, the issues, the environmental issues that are really important here. Um, we're also seeing governments, uh, just like an EV, the two biggest factor in EV adoption are uh, government regulations and government incentives. So we're seeing a lot of nudging towards the right decisions, let's say, for the greater good. And uh, that tips the economic scales for a lot of these businesses to be relevant now and become really great investments. Yeah, the last, Sarah, we, the we last, need to hear from the venture capitalist on the panels. So. Yeah, I was going to try to bring in kind of the early stage of the funnel where we sit, which, you know, it's it does seem as though all the stars are aligning, right? You have the market structures in place. You have all of these big companies pledging net zero decarbonization, you know, various timeframes. And then on top of that, you have a decade of maturing technology, solar and wind and you know, geothermal, a lot of these core industrial platforms that have been enhanced over the last decade. And from where we sit, there's also been continued R&D spending from the federal government and all of these incubator, accelerator, demo day, like early stage entrepreneurial support mechanisms. There were like two of them in 2007 and now there's about 50, one in every state. And so all of these resources exist. And of the 10,000 things that are sitting in the lab, we have the, for better or worse, you know, the hard job of picking through you know, 1,000 or 1,500 of the best ideas and trying to pick the two, three, four, five that are really unique and novel. And the constraint that we see, there's this massive opportunity to capture energy technology commercialization, but there's not enough early stage capital. And what we're saying, seeing is that there's about 6.2 late stage dollars for every early stage dollar that gets invested. So you have this huge gap where, you know, once those companies raise a series A or a series B, or they've gotten through that first valley of death and they have a few customers, then there's plenty of capital that's ready to line up behind them and help them scale. But there's so many great technologies that are still in that very early stage of the funnel, trying to prove out that they're unique, that they have a value proposition that's economic, that there's a moat around their technology that they can sustain over time, um, and that their investors, they have a business model that their investors can make money. So um, it's going to get, it's going to get wild. Um, I think, you know, we've already started to see there are certainly entrepreneurs that are out there that are ready to, to scale in that way. Um, there are also entrepreneurs who are at the very early phases and they're just sort of benefiting from the irrational exuberance that exists around this sector, you know, raising very large amounts of capital just as they're getting their businesses going. So Interesting times ahead. Buckle your seatbelt. Sarah, that really surprises me that to hear there's not enough capital because I mean I've been I've been reading the papers and I see this is a early record stage. year for early venture. stage. Early I don't stage disagree capital. With Sarah. It's kind of fascinating to me because I do believe that people are throwing a limited amount of money to scaling risk, but much, much more cautious on technology risk. Uh, and that's why I do believe that corporates can actually help play a part in that. In that, in that bridging between the traditional venture capital, you know, technologies out of the world into the energy and scale type of the world, right? Because corporates are uniquely positioned to some extent to potentially help identify which ones are those technologies that actually kind of do hold water in scale relative to others. And I, that's why I think Roger, to some extent, you're also seeing so many corporates starting to do venture capital investments. Yeah, I mean, in the energy, in traditional energy space, I haven't watched the, you know, the show Silicon Valley. I would never, never know what a Series A is. Like, it's, just, it, it's not something we've ever done before, right? Or we've been forced to do before, we had to do before, but now using our skills and starting investing in some of this stuff, um, it's, it's what I think can, can actually be pretty powerful, pa partnering with some of these VCs. Yeah, I would add that uh, in this particular in these particular sectors, the, the line between R&D and commercialization stages is particularly blurry. Uh, which throws off a lot of investors uh, who are looking at this as still development funds and are not eager to get involved with relatively large investments 
and a lot of capex investment, uh, particularly with these companies before you know years before they'll see revenue. So this has uh, been a particular challenge. Kelly, you're usually on the exit side, aren't you, as a banker? I mean, is there a is there a kind of a robust exit scenario there? A lot of M&A activity, or that that might be that might be uh, applicable to this particular sector. Well, we, we do capital raise and M&A and SPAC M&A in some cases as well, where we represent the companies. Uh, so we are, um, I'd say, you know, as a VC, I was in a much earlier stage. Now, of course, we're more venture growth and later stage where uh, the companies are pretty substantial. Uh, but still, uh, even at that stage, when these companies have several hundred million, let's say, uh, they've been investing in technology, they may still be, uh, you know, relatively far away from 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 substantial revenue. And um, the exit market is interesting. There's some consolidation on things that are becoming obvious, for example, with charging networks. Uh, there's still things that are further away in the horizon. For example, everything that's happening in hydrogen, um, that, that's quite far away. And uh, you know, these, these are pretty technical topics. So when you're talking about you know, traditional angel investment class that can understand consumer software because they can relate to it, they certainly can't necessarily relate to you know, hydrogen fuel cells, how they would affect aviation or long-term trucking and the infrastructure involved there. So there's definitely a lot of challenges because you're uh, the early stage and kind of mid-stage, um, early venture stage, uh, you still have a lot of challenges because the pool of potential investors here is quite small still. So um, it, it would be great to see, let's say, more government push, much like we had at the early days of Silicon Valley in the 70s, 60s and 70s, when the government really decided that it's going to back uh, Silicon Valley and, and uh, change the economic scales a bit to motivate um, risk capital to come to that particular to those sectors those days. We still need more of that to accelerate the pace of development in energy. Um, so, so on that, I mean, most of our audience, I believe, uh, is probably early stage. Uh, it's probably tech entrepreneurs and they're probably here because they'd like to know what the market looks like and 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 maybe what it would, you know, what's what's investable. And I heard Guillermo talk about technology risk. Uh, I, I guess I'm I'm hearing you kind of say something similar that that there are a lot of competing technologies. What do you as investors look for when a company comes to you, especially an early stage company? What's going to get you to write that check? And Osama, you haven't said anything for a while, so I think I'm going to direct that to you. <laughs> right. So. Uh... I think for us, um, you know, EDF is a pretty big company, so it, it does a lot of different things. Um, one thing that really, you know, captures our attention, if we see how the technology is applicable beyond the US market, and that's a particular case for us, is that if we think that the same technology could be applicable where we can help, particularly again, like I said, France and the UK and Italy and, and Belgium or, or Europe in general, um, because I guess, you know, we're guilty of what was said earlier that from the investment perspective, at least, we are shy of very early stage because we EDF has a, a very robust, strong uh, R&D activity and an open innovation activity. So the, the thesis we have is if it's the technology is not yet proven, there's other avenues for the corporate to support beyond investment. But when it comes to investment, we do want to see, you know, the, the market potential a little bit, you know, proven out. Um, maybe not to, to the, there's still obviously some growth and development risk that we take or product market fit definitely when we go from one geography to another. Uh, but I think if, if we see a company or a solution that really addresses a need uh, directly to our customers, that really gets our attention. Mm. Um, you know, interestingly enough, like when we see a company that is doing something different than what our business units typically do, uh, that also gets our attention. Uh, because part of our job is to be aware of how entrepreneurs can see the problem differently and come up with different solutions than, say, a legacy company that's, you know, been doing the same thing over and over again the same way. Sarah, uh, do, do you agree? Kind of the same idea? Yeah, I, I mean, I think for us, um, the advice that I would have is just make sure you do a little bit of research on who you're talking to at the onset of the conversation. So you know, should you lead with the strategic overlap if it's a corporate VC? Should you lead with, you know, the key metrics and are you aligned with the stage that, you know, this particular fund invests at? You know, there's nothing more 
um, disheartening than when we sit through a, an amazing pitch and everything is like check, check, check. And then they're like, and we're raising, you know, $30 million. And we're like, well, I wish we would have talked to you like five years ago. Um, so, you know, usually we can screen those out pretty early. That doesn't always happen. That doesn't ever happen really. Um, and, well, but, you know, Sarah, what would that box have to look like? What should the check box say? For, for us, I mean, it's raising usually less than 5 million bucks. Okay. And, you know, for a financial investor, you know, that's investing at the early stage, we need to have enough equity in your business, knowing that you're going to continue to need to raise money and we're going to have some dilution. Um, knowing that the size of our, the initial pool of capital we started with was about 25 million bucks. And so the economics of our fund and the number of investments we'll do and the amount of capital we'll put into each company is a very careful balance on capturing the upside and the things that are really taking off, but also not getting overexposed because the nature of, of this you know, industry is that it's really hard. It takes a lot of time. There is technology risk. And so if you, know, you fall down and stumble, which most entrepreneurs do, you know, the idea is that you have some investors around the table that can help, you know, support you through that pivot or, you know, help you identify a different um, technology roadmap uh, or customer roadmap. And so if you blow through too much money at the beginning before you figure out all the problems, then you're going to be in a tough spot to keep going back to the well and saying, I need to raise more, I need to raise more. So, um, you know, I wish we could have endless, you know, check writing ability for, for really smart teams, but, you know, number one, it's just sort of being aware of like that staging of where you are in your business and the kinds of investors you should be talking to. Um, and for us, just the point on differentiation, you know, it is challenging because in our shoes where we sit, we're seeing, like I said, a thousand things a year, we have a database of over 5,000 ideas, companies, science projects, um, We've seen a lot. And so it's really be prepared to defend that you're unique, be prepared to defend why and how you're differentiated from the competition. Um, it's harder to do these and do that in certain technology verticals than others, right? Building energy software, um, grid, distributed energy resource software, like so crowded, very difficult to, to be you know, unique. Uh, on the basis of just technology. So be ready to defend and define what you, why you win in those, in those cases where the barriers to entry are low or um, it's more about a business model or a team. So lots of different factors for us that we're thinking about when we meet with entrepreneurs. Any other comments on that before I move on? I'll just say, I, you know, my only advice, I guess, from my side, and probably a little self-serving to some extent, but, um, you know, to the extent, and this, I realize this may not be applicable to more consumer direct energy technologies, but to the extent that, to the extent that you have technology that's on the industrial scale, try to potentially find a partner and, and really to, to Sarah's point, do your research about, you know, how can, how can that partner in the energy space help you with with your own business how are they going to understand you are they going to make you make a better case to further rounds of investors right are they going to help you validate your thesis your technology whatever that may be to help you get in front of people on the vc side that you will need along the way anyway uh for a long time right but potentially think about uh partnering to some extent with energy participants you know, at the end of the day, it all everyone in the energy space has their ears wide open um, to new technologies and new ideas today. You take that, you know, take advantage of that. Um, everybody's everybody's keen to finding out what's going to be the next thing. And to the extent that there's a corporate that has certain skills or capabilities or businesses or business units or assets that may be interesting or helpful or platform to you as, a, as an entrepreneur, go talk to that company. <laughs> Um, and, and you'll be surprised, uh, you know, you, you, you'll get attention and, 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 and a lot of times having that corporate by your side helps you validate your story and protect, like kind of help you grow with BC as, as time goes by. 
You know, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of, of, of you mention the technology risk and the technology issues here. And I do a lot of panels, venture panels in different industries, but it seems like that might be a bigger issue in this particular industry than a lot of other ones. Uh, so again, for our entrepreneurs in the audience, uh, I think what I'm hearing is that not only do they have to have all the other fundamentals, uh, product market fit, et cetera, but they, they have to be able to show that their stuff will actually solve the problem, right? That it works. Um, and that might be one of the challenges in the space. Any, anybody want to elaborate on that a little bit? Well, in our industry, it's really hard to pivot. It's hard to <laughs> you pivot. Know that you can have a solution in energy, energy technology, and all of a sudden we realize, now nah, maybe, maybe you should do something different. Whereas maybe, maybe in other parts of the, the venture world, it's, it's a little easier to pivot. But with us, it's, it's very technology, like specific hardware technology specific. Like what, what are we doing to, to clean tech? I don't know. Yeah, I would say that the feedback loop is, is definitely much longer here than, than in software spaces where you can uh, kind of rapidly develop and get out in the market. Um, here, there has to be a certain belief level and certain time investment, resource investment to get an outcome, which may come years later. And that takes a certain amount of uh, faith <laughs> uh, from all, all the stakeholders, the investors, and of course, the entrepreneurs that are dedicating their life to it. Uh, oftentimes, uh, these innovations come out of university and, and the, there's the added uh, component that you have founders who are typically researchers or engineering heavy and light on on business building experience, um, we'd usually look for a combination where there's experience management at the table that can help uh, kind of bridge the gap through the process and, and getting getting from that threshold of R&D into commercialization, getting those first customers on board. Those are really crucial elements. Otherwise, these uh, innovations never really get out of the gate. Yeah. You know, on that, Vitale, it's kind of interesting that when it comes to, to, to energy technologies, it's the one place where I see, maybe it's because it's, it's a lot of science uh, background sort of founders. It's the one place where I see people get, and investors too, absolutely seduced by the technology. They see a solution that's going to solve every problem in the world. And uh, even after it's just not commercially viable, uh, you see people cling to it for a long time. <laughs> Um, so the technology piece here, uh, I guess going along with what you're saying, you see a lot of founders that maybe come out of universities and research in institutions, and that's just one of the one of the characteristics of this industry. But it is solvable. I mean, you know what we look for because we're okay with taking technology risk. It's just inherent to everything that we invest in, and so what we're looking for not is that there's no risk. But we're looking to see, does this team have a grasp on what, you know, what the customer actually wants? And do they have some semblance of what it will cost when they get to scale? And is there an opportunity to make money? Um, do they, have they targeted the right use cases for this technology? So that, you know, if you know that at the end of the day, you need to be you know, at, at a, you know, a three foot by three foot panel, and they're at a postage stamp, like what is their plan for going from postage stamp to sheet of paper to, you know, windshield to, you know, ultimately the commercial product. And if they don't have a team that can think about those kinds of things and then look at, are there early revenue opportunities? Would somebody buy our sheet of paper as a product? And how can we use that non-dilutive capital to fund the development? So, you know, it's all these pieces that have to feed in at the same time. And the way that we get comfortable with technology risk is we just have to triangulate from all different sources as part of our diligence. We're talking to the science um, you know, leaders in a given vertical. We're understanding what the key challenges are. We're trying to figure out, can we plug some holes on the team and fill in some experience gaps as part of our diligence? We're talking to the customers to understand, okay, what proof points do you need to see before you're willing to test this, before you're willing to buy it, before you're willing to integrate it into your channel? And in that way, we're sort of building this risk management roadmap for the, the technology and its productization path. And so if you have, I think to Vitaly's point, you know, if you have some research scientists who are brilliant at what they do, that's great, but you need some investors or some advisors, um, even who are not full time to just like lean in and really help shape and mold this, this you know, idea into a real business. 
And it takes a lot of hard work and it doesn't always work at the first try. So the importance, and I can't underscore this enough, the importance of non-dilutive, whether it's grant funding or whether it's customer development uh, funding, both of, a lot of our companies that are early, like hard science companies, that's how they fund the early stages of their, of their research and of their development. Because it, you know, you can't just throw a bunch of money at the problem and make it go away. It just takes time and iterations, and you have to be able to work through those um, and get to defined value inflection points along the way. Yeah, you know, speaking of non-dilutive funding, you know, there's budget negotiations going on right now, and and the Biden proposed budget uh, really emphasizes uh, money for uh, alternative energy technology, especially the, the tax credits. Uh, wind and solar in particular. And I got to believe that's something to your point, Vitaly, you were saying like back in the 60s and 70s and government got behind innovation. This is an area we might see government getting behind some early innovation or maybe not, but that ought to help. Huh? Yeah, I mean, I can I can certainly answer that. One of our advisors to Drake Star is Mark Joseph, who was the uh, subcommittee chairman on infrastructure uh, during Biden's campaign and transition and is one of the authors of uh, what's now the infrastructure plan or parts of it. And there's definitely a lot of nudging going on. So much like uh, cash for clunkers back in uh, 2009, 2010, uh, where there was an effort to, uh, to uh, on the one hand, help the auto industry, on the other hand, to actually get polluting vehicles off the, off the roads. There's a similar component here to, uh, to convert a lot of the fleets already and, and really put money behind the infrastructure. So one of the biggest things that doesn't get talked about too much yet is that right now there are about 47,000 fast chargers in the United States, many of those Tesla. Um, and the infrastructure plan has half a million chargers built into it where the federal government would essentially subsidize that. So we're talking about, you know, uh, 10x growth here very, very quickly in number of chargers over a period of a few years and simplifying the whole process. This will definitely help with the transition. Uh, certainly this will then make uh, energy generation and various forms of it and energy storage a much bigger priority. So it kind of accelerates everything forward. And it seems that if those efforts are successful, within a few years, we'll see US take the leadership position as far as new energy, um, in part just from the automotive fleet, uh, which is a big, big area of conversion. Uh, the other thing is, you know, it, it's very easy, uh, Roger, as you mentioned, um, is to, get, to kind of fall in love with the technology. It brought up the, one of my favorite uh, movies, uh, The Saint from the 90s, if you remember, where, um, where the woman invented uh, cold fusion. And there was, uh, there was a, lot of, a lot of hype and activity. I mean, yes, there, there's a, there, it's easy to fall in love with the potential of the different technologies. And we've seen it, you know, time and again with solid state lithium ion and all sorts of different energy generation um, efficiencies where the promise is 10, 20, 100x improvement. Uh, but those things take a long, long time and a lot of steps in research and there needs to be patient capital and expectations need to be somewhat tempered as far as how long it takes to get there. We'll eventually get there theoretically. Uh, but it takes uh, kind of a different timeline and different um, different time scale, let's say, than what a lot of early stage investors are used to uh, and have been spoiled with in the last two decades with software. Okay, well, you know, I, I don't want to let you all get away without getting into some of the specific technologies that, that you're really interested in. <laughs> um, um, very excited about some of the things you're investing in. And Guillermo, I know your answer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a big fan of geothermal, you know, and I have been for, for 20 years. That's one of those where I just think the technology hasn't quite caught up to the, to the potential and a promise yet, but maybe it has, or maybe it will. Can you tell yeah, us? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, think, I think geothermal is fascinating, right? Because it doesn't have the intermediate issues that, that solar and wind have. So it doesn't have to be combined with a massive amount of energy storage, which allows us to spend our mineral resources in developing energy storage for mobility and not for industrial processes and for power plants, right? Just as simple as that. I mean, it's, you know, there, there's a lot of mining that needs to get done to get all this storage that needs to happen around the world. And with geothermal, you don't have that, right? Now, nobody's really cracked the nut how to get it how to get to supercritical temperatures, how to do that efficiently, how to make it so, get, get deep enough that it becomes hot enough, that it becomes efficient enough to actually compete thoughtfully. 
Uh, so we love geothermal. Um, to some extent, we really like energy storage, but you know we're trying to figure out alternatives to potentially uh, to, to to potentially lithium, cobalt, nickel. Thinking about potentially supercapacitors, things like that that can help us at the industrial scale potentially manage our energy needs uh, with respect to our engines themselves. Uh, we we like hydrogen as a potential fuel for reducing emissions uh, across our platform, um, and and you know. I think offshore wind would be pretty interesting to us too. I think there's some robotic applications uh, where we can be of help in developing and growing. And last but not least, carbon capture and, and utilization. I think the I think the, the the way we at least at neighbors we can be successful or in, in helping somebody is through measuring and validation systems and 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 uh, technologies. I don't think I think that's one of the very gaps with respect to CCUS. It's really hard to measure and validate and 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 to know what's actually getting sequestered, what is not, how much is, is getting is you know is actually staying there forever and, and 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 all that. And I think, you know, via us having to have remote operations around the world and being able to measure emissions around the world remotely and all the stuff, we may have some sensors technology and things like that where it could be actually of potential help. Th those are the things where we're spending most of our time on. Interesting. Osama, how about you? Is there any particular technologies that you that are your favorites? Yeah, we we all technology are my favorites, but uh, I think at the moment we've been quite um, focused on a couple of um, you know solutions around smart home and smart building, uh, not just from the energy perspective, but also from other services uh, that could rely on on kind of better sensing and, and better connected buildings and or homes. So not just uh, what you typically think of a smart home for energy, but other things like, you know, insurance services, maintenance services, uh, security, uh, and same with, same with building within the building. You know, the coming back to work, um, think about it more of a healthy building is something that we've been taking a look at to see if there are solutions that we could, you know, help deploy. Not us, but just you know, we could enable companies who are working on that solution that we could help them grow. The, the carbon and ESG activity is, is quite interesting for, for us here in the investment perspective in the, in the US. And at a group level, I think hydrogen and, and carbon utilization is, is still pretty much the, one of the main focus areas. Um, you know, EDF is, is largely a nuclear and hydro company. So we've been very fortunate that we've been very kind of low carbon intensity utility from that perspective. Uh, but hydrogen and carbon capture utilization really seem to be the future generations and the future iteration where EDF could play a big role there. You didn't say so. Beyond, beyond, beyond the investment, at least a little bit, it really more of the group level, strategic level. Uh, these are things that we're taking a look at as well. Yeah, I was just noting, I don't think you said solar and all of that. Is that... Uh... Because for us, solar is, is now integral. I don't think it's considered new in any way. Um, EDF Renewables is, is the largest business units within EDF, uh, operates really globally. Uh, I think they're the third solar uh, player in the US and, and really maybe the fifth globally. So it's quite quite part of our core business. So for us, so yeah, offshore wind, onshore wind, solar and storage at the utility scale is our core business, <laughs> to, be, to be frank. So maybe that's why for us, I don't see them necessarily as emerging technologies. I see. Okay, interesting. Um, Sarah? Um, let's see. I mean, there's trying to add something new to the conversation. I think um, the way we look at opportunities is less sometimes about specific technology verticals and more about just opportunistic trends that we're seeing and, and sort of um, projecting future forward. A lot of the time, the, the stage of the deals we're seeing is like two, three, five years ahead of what's coming to market. So we're, we're usually trying to look at some of those volumetric changes and then determine on the basis of, you know, the team and the market and the opportunity, like, is there is there reason to do a deep dive into one that's sort of having a lot of activity? Um, two years ago, we invested in and led the series seed of a long duration grid scale storage company called E-Zinc. And now, you know, two years later, every day in the news, you're hearing stuff about long duration and just the need for it as the, you know, the growth of renewables continues to occur and the need for resiliency um, gets even more 
um, acute. And so those are the kinds of things we're looking for. And we're not going to, we're probably not going to go invest in three or four more long duration companies, but we're looking for that next, like over the next horizon, which is usually something that is either disrupting one of the large, you know, industrial incumbents where innovation is really hard and they've squeezed out cost, they've optimized in every way they can, but innovating is something entirely different. And so we're looking for those opportunities where they're taking, you know, an old way of doing something and turning it on its head. And then either, you know, we can work with them to put a plan together to go in and partner with those folks who might see this as additive to their business or um, compete with them if, uh, if there's no path to partnership. Telly, did we miss anything? Any technologies we should mention here? I've got a whole long list of them I didn't hear yet, but I'd like yeah. to hear the investors think. Yeah, I mean, I would say, um, you know, it's, a, it's an incredibly exciting time. And, and I think the message that I would like to get across is that it's still very, very early days for all of this. You know, we're looking at it from the perspective of the $5 trillion transportation logistics industry that's being driven, you know, a huge generational transition that's being driven by new energy. And, um, you know, we're really, really at, at the tip of it. I mean, just look at the passenger EVs, you know, it, it's, we're still under 4% penetration. You know, we have a long way to go and it's going to go very, very quickly, you know, from this point forward. Um, the interesting thing is that the pandemic really reorganized the supply chains and made things uh, quite interesting in a way that, um, that didn't exist before. I mean, basically there was a lot of resistance in the supply chains uh, but when all the factories shut down, all the suppliers shut down, they were all of a sudden free to rethink how they're going to reopen. And that's why you saw a big acceleration in vehicles. Um, so hopefully we'll see more of that on the energy side, kind of the energy generation, storage, etc. Uh, and we're, we're, you know, so it, it's an incredibly exciting time, kind of all up and down the stack, the technology stack and a lot of these related categories. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> So let me jump ahead and ask you the question that, that you're going to get in the Q&A. You know, I haven't looked at the Q&A, but everybody asks us, they want to know the one thing is probably the biggest reason our audience is here. They want to know what's going to get you to invest in them. And in particular, when you see a company doing a particular uh, technology in a particular industry or, or attacking a particular problem, you know, I know that you see a lot of companies doing that, right? And the question everybody always has is, well, we have a panel of investors here. How do I get the investor to pick me? <laughs> and Sarah, as, as the financial investor here, the VC, I, you know, I, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on this. Um, it's such a, there's so many dimensions to this, to this question. So <laughs> assuming that you have something that if it works, that it matters, that's sort of the first screen. Um, I, I'll maybe touch on the soft skills. Number one, have your shit together. Like, don't be a mess. Have a data room that has a functional Excel spreadsheet. Um, know your numbers. Be ready to get into the weeds. Uh, if you don't know or haven't thought through the answers to some of these questions, like, just be transparent and say, listen, I'm at the early stages. Um, there's nothing worse than somebody who comes in like completely unprepared and it's, it's very obvious. So, um, just be genuine and, you know, tell us what you're working on and come to us early. Don't, you know, don't come to us like three weeks before you expect to close or telling us you're going to close in three weeks, even if you know, that's not true and say, are you in or out? Because we're a team of four people and we have 20 portfolio companies and we look at 1500 companies a year and so it may not work right we might be working on two or three other deals or a company might be fundraising and so it the timing is really you have to make sure you sort of work that in so the earlier you can come to us and introduce what it is you're working on why it's unique get a little feedback on well here's the pieces that are question marks in our mind and if you can come back with a a plan that addresses these risk areas or come back and show some progress in these areas, then it will probably make us more likely to wanna dig in and get into diligence. And, and we can then sort of bake you into our mental model of what we wanna work on next. Um, so just, you know, 
think about those just sort of basic um, intrapersonal skills of, you know, how do you interact with people and how do you put your best foot forward when you're, you know, trying to raise money from people? How about the founding team? Do you need a co- do you need a technical co-founder? Maybe more so in this particular industry than in others, or can that be outsourced? I mean, typically you need. Typically there is a technical co-founder, um, and if there's not, I mean, we look at that. We look at those kinds of opportunities too, right? Where there's a repeat entrepreneur who says, "I'm looking to do something next," and if we've gotten to know them over time, or you know, maybe it's a former portfolio company uh, of ours, executive, we'll sort of bring them into the fold on here's some interesting things that we're looking at, see if you can put a business plan around one of them. Um, but usually I would say there tends to be a technical founder, um, varying levels of interest in being the CTO or going into being the operator in the business, right? Sometimes they want to remain the technical founder and in more of an advisory capacity and bring in the team to, to scale it or, you know, grow it or what, you know, whatever the case may be. So there's really no one size fits all. And and the last, last one for you, I've heard it said a couple of times, this product market fit idea. I'm trying to get my brain around what that looks like in this particular industry. It's not like I can go count the number of downloads in the the app store. Uh, What is it in terms of proving to you, what would it take to prove to you that there's a market for something? I mean, the best evidence is that they actually have an early customer that they're working with that's saying, yes, I like what you're doing. Um, Maybe they're even paying for some of it. I mean, there's no substitute for that. Um, If they don't have a customer, if they're still kind of, you know, keeping things behind closed doors, that's okay. But they need to be able to talk in terms of really what the value proposition is. It What is going to cause their target customer to say, I have to have this. It's not a nice to have. It doesn't just make things a little bit better. It makes things dramatically better. And it's really hard to do that. Um, And oftentimes, you know, you have a hypothesis on what that value proposition is, but you have to then go test it and then tweak it until you land on that thing that is, oh, they want this because of X, Y, Z. It's not at all because I thought, you know, that this would, um, you know, maybe you thought it would solve a problem in one area that's not really a problem for them because they have something internally developed or they have another startup that they're working with. So just, you know, being able to really test and iterate on what that product market fit should look like and how the, how you get there. Yeah. Osama from, from corporate venture side, what's the winning founder look like to you? Really what Sarah just said at the end here, I think um, if the founder really shows that they understand their customer, it really makes things for us very interesting to work with them. Uh, because on the technology side, again, we could always rely internally uh, on the R&D to validate and understand. So sure, you want them to really know everything about their technology, but that's not going to maybe get us as excited as they really understand their customer. Uh, you know, a trick for energy is that it's huge. It's in the trillion. And, and in many cases, we see founders who say, you know, my solution improves by 10% or 8% or what have you. And then they multiply that by the trillions of dollars. And they say, here is the opportunity for us. And for, for us, it's, it shows that maybe you not really know the difference between the total market and the real addressable market, because it's, there's no way you'll be you know, deployed everywhere. And what we want to hear is that how are you going to get your first, second, and third paying customers? Uh, because you know, at 10%, maybe it's not going to be reasonable for anybody or as many people to deploy it. So uh, we look for founders who really understand their potential customers. Could we call that domain expertise? On the again, on the application and deployment side, more than on maybe on the technology and the innovation side, yes. Uh, yeah. And that's maybe addressing your product market fit is, is that if they already are working with some sort of a customer, and they understand, you know, all the lessons learned from that engagement. Many in many cases with energy, you find pilots demonstrations, you know, which is great. Uh, but when we see that, we really ask them like, what are you going to learn? What is the customer going to learn and how does these learnings really would lead to deployment uh, more than just proof of concept. 
Guillermo, you've had to, you know, <laughs> yeah. had your choice recently. Yeah. Well, for us, it's, it's two things, right? Number one is whatever you're doing, can we see it at an industrial utility scale deployed? You know, can, can we see a future for that happening? That's obviously important. That comes along with a bunch of questions, right? About obviously the the, the technology itself has to work and all the stuff and the found we can have to see, we don't necessarily have to see the founders being, like, you know, see the management of a public company, but we, we need to see the founders knowing and understanding the market enough and the product enough to know that they can actually get it, bootstrap their way up to at least an industrial scale product. Now, that's one. Two, how is, I want to understand from the founder, and some of the examples of what we've done recently is obvious, but, you know, from founder of other stuff is, <clears throat> how can you see me helping you? Uh, what are the tools that I have, uh, you know, what are the tools that our company has that you can use? I think you you could exist faster, get there faster because, because you can access us, right, Roger? I mean, ultimately, we've made three pretty material investments over the last, uh, you know, I mean, I, I guess I joined like two and a half months ago and we made massive, uh, three, three pretty material investments in, in pretty, what we believe will be pretty disruptive technologies in geothermal, which somehow at some point I'm going to have to get you in front of our CEOs that portfolio. Um, I think you, you, you'll like some of that stuff that they're working on. But apart from that is, um, you know, if, if we're gonna if we're gonna spend our corporate resources, and we're gonna dedicate engineers and R and D staff and, and, and attention and management attention to some of these guys, uh, how do we choose it? You know, the top six to twelve things that we think can actually be successful. We're not we're not gonna take a shotgun approach. Just throw, you know, a million dollars to 50 things. I'd rather, you know, throw $15 million at four things, if that makes sense, or three things, if that makes sense to you. Um, so, so, that, so that they actually can use the power of the company, so that they can actually get attention from our engineering uh, group and our R&D group and our automation group and our manufacturing group and whatever that may be. Vitaly, I think you're going to get the last word on this. What's a, you've seen a lot of founders not only go from, from the start, but to successful exits. What's a successful founder in this particular industry look like? Well, at the end of the day, um, it, you're building a business. And um, what's, what's important, I'll tell you, you know, all investors want to see uh, either revenue uh, or a believable plan that you will commercialize this, this invention and then you're not just talking about the potential, but at some point you're actually building a business out of it. And uh, certainly there's a big difference between selling or trying to sell, let's say, technology that has potential and the business that has revenue. Uh, the, the results are usually, you know, orders of magnitude different. And as far as going out to funding and investors will always ask you to really show kind of time scale when this will become a business. And that's when it really becomes valuable. Science experiments are great. Uh, but uh, those are really in the realm of university research in this category. Um, for investors to start coming in, it needs to look like a business, needs to be in a time scale of a venture fund, meaning that you can get to an exit in under 10 years, hopefully much, much lower than that. Um, and it's really important to be able to demonstrate that. So uh, I think it's very important to have the right people on your team who, who have a track record of commercializing technology and uh, building a product out of an invention. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you, panel, for that presentation. I think we're going to go ahead and open it up to questions now. If you have questions, use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Don't use the chat box. Use the Q&A box, and uh, I will curate. So <clears throat> one question here is it says that the doors are very hard to open to develop totally new technology. Uh, the government through SBIR has their topics that are directed to current technologies. So there's not a lot of money in access. Um, well, I guess, what about that, Vitaly? You talked a little bit about um, how there is federal money available. Is, is it easy to get? Is it hard to get? Um, is it going to get easier? What do you think? Um, I will say I would hope it, it will get easier as this becomes a more important category. Um, at the same time, part of your competitive advantage is your ability at these early stages to get grant money and know how to do that kind of fundraise and be able to be successful with it. Because oftentimes that will be the only capital that is appropriate for very early stage, kind of a more research phase um, production that you're doing. 
So um, that's that's going to be a key factor. And then at some point, you're going to have to ship gears and and uh, and look at commercial investors who are looking at the company from a different financial lens and and well, rather a financial lens, not just an impact lens. Um, will it get easier? Perhaps um, I would hope so. Uh, but at the same time, again, it's it's kind of a you're going to lose the moat for some of these companies that otherwise are just using their capability of being able to raise grant funding as a competitive advantage. So um, that would be um, that would be my approach is, you know, uh, looking at, um, at different phases of funding, which is much more prevalent in here than in other categories of uh, venture venture fundable companies. Anybody else have anything to add to that? I mean, if the question is about um, SBIRs and, and how do you get the attention of these program managers on something new, I mean, there's definitely, there's a whole other art to government grants, which I've had that life before too. And it very much means if you're interested in going that route, you have to play the game, which means you have to go, you have to find all the programs that could be funding what you're working on. And if they're not funding it, if it's completely new and it's not even on their radar, you've got to put it on their radar. You've got to schedule time to sit down with them and go through what you're doing, why it matters, and why it should be part of their, their R&D roadmap for the kinds of things they want to fund. Because that's what all these other entrepreneurs are doing, all these other research scientists, for better or worse. That's why they're getting written into the, the, you know, the topic areas are written because the program managers are looking at you know, what's out there that fills these gaps. So I think you have to do some education and outreach to even get specced in to be on the list of, you know, what the government would be looking to fund. And then if you can do that successfully, it, it might take a couple of turns. You know, it's really hard. It's competitive, some of these programs. Um, some of them are less competitive. So like understanding that landscape is, is a challenge. Um, but if you can get through the other side of it, investors love to know that their investment capital is going to be leveraged with some non-dilutive money. And there's nothing better than SBIR because you don't have to have a matching component to it. So you can just, you know, utilize the capital. Once you start to get to some of the applied research programs, it's like a 50% match. So um, the onus to fundraise is you know, is much more important um, because otherwise you can't get the grant funding. So, but it's hard. Yep, yep, okay. Um, so we have a comment here that uh, wind and solar will have to be replaced since they're causing bigger problems due to natural disasters and life expectancy. Uh, well, I wanna ask our panel of experts, what do you think about that? Is wind and solar the future or is it something that's going to have to be replaced? Because you got to make the you're actually putting your money on on, on your projections. So uh, anybody want to take that? Guillermo, tell me about geothermal again. I know I love geothermal. Right. You know I love it, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> you know, base load is awesome. Uh, no mineral mining is awesome. Uh, obviously, we got to figure out how to go deep enough to make it efficient. But once you do. Um, it makes a lot of sense. I, I do. I do see that it makes makes a lot of sense. I think. I think the base load component of it is big, right? Because it's really hard to manage our so growing electricity needs around the world without, you know, kind of on demand electricity whenever you need. And so that ability to have constant twenty four seven ability to generate electricity, independent if there's wind or sun or not, or having to to rely on on batteries which, you know, leave the batteries to where the better use is, not for, potentially it's not for utility scale um, stuff, right? That, that's, why, that's why nuclear makes sense. Um, yeah. That's why natural so, gas makes sense, you know, so. Yeah. So just for our audience, when, by base load, I think what you mean is with geothermal, you don't have, the wind doesn't have to be blowing, the sun doesn't have to be shining. You've always got that steady supply. Correct. And, and of course the problems are, as you said, you know, down at extreme temperatures and, and all that pressure. Uh, we don't really know how materials are going to react just yet, do we? Correct. I mean, part of the issue is we don't know. We It's really hard for us to drill that deep, right? I mean, if you want to make your thermal reality everywhere, you got to be able to make it work for not only in the places around the world that are hot, close to the surface, meaning you got to drill, drill deep enough to get to those temperatures that change the 
ther like the, the physics, if you will, of the fluids. The fluids are carrying the energy up. Theoretically, you know, once you get to a certain amount of temperature, uh, some of these fluids that carry temperature up become superfluids, which means they carry a significant amount more energy than they do at regular temperatures. Like water would call 10 times more energy when it's a superfluid at about 375C. What you accomplish then is a massive increase in efficiency as you're moving turbines at the top, right? So you think about, um, you know, the efficiency of a normal geothermal plant it has to be in a specific location where it's hot, close to the surface, probably not even that hot. It's very different than somewhere where you can put everywhere in the world, but you gotta be very, very, very deep and you get to that much hotter rock. Um, and, then, and then the efficiency just becomes yeah. massively accretive. And just to be clear, you know, there's, I think of it being two kinds of geothermal. There's what you're talking about is really deep pull. And then there's the shallower hole geothermal that we've seen a kind of a big explosion of yeah. recently over the last few years where people go down 100, 200 feet and bring up cool air. Uh, Correct. Which is much different, but both. Yeah, yeah. Very well, I'm talking about utility scale generation yeah. of electricity, right? Like and real power plants. Out of real it. power plants. And out here in California, of course, we've got a renewable portfolio standard that requires uh, alternative energy. I think it was about 6% geothermal last time I looked. It's pretty high because we've got the geysers up north. You got the geysers, correct. Yeah. Anybody else want to weigh in? <laughs> want to take that or is that too touchy a topic? Wind and solar? I, I cannot uh, thought on it. I mean, certainly, you know, wind and solar have a higher maintenance, um, you know, requirement, but um, in absence of other technologies, you know, people a lot of times, in a lot of cases, think about, oh, well, let's go for the ultimate solution. Uh, but that ultimate solution might be, you know, 10, 20 years. In, in, in the meantime, uh, you know, clock is ticking and we need to have some maybe transitional technologies. Maybe there will be an improvement on solar, but uh, it certainly seems to be a good solution. I have a, you know, eight kilowatt system on my house and in the summer, you know, I, I send energy back to the grid. Um, certainly it's not, it's not good year round, even here in Northern California, but uh, still this is, uh, you know, this is quite relevant and it will be a good decade or two before something else comes along that that's a, that's a replacement. So maybe at end of life of current generation technologies, that's when we'll see the next generation of more effective, more efficient um, renewable generation technologies. And to Vitaly's point, at some point, Cold Fusion will make us all just pack up our stuff and go home, you know? But in the meantime, gotta live with what we have. Yep. Maybe to just to add, if need, like, if the concern is around kind of extreme weather events um, and, how, and how that kind of trickles down on an energy infrastructure, I think all energy infrastructure, no matter what it is, is gonna be impacted uh, by these extreme weather events. Uh, whether it's temperature, storms, flooding, um, fires, and solar, I think, paired with storage, does have an advantage of being able to be distributed well enough. So from that perspective, actually, solar is maybe a lot more relevant uh, in many cases to withstand extreme weather events that hits infrastructure. Because infrastructure cost and timeline and stuff like that is, is very difficult to, to do quickly and, and well. So from that perspective, I think, solar actually stands a better chance in many cases to address extreme weather events than maybe definitely nuclear, as we've seen in Japan, um, you know, even gas plants. So, you know, keeping that in mind, I think uh, there's room for many solutions to address that. Um, and, and what you're saying is because it uses less infrastructure, there's a benefit to that. I think, right, I think solar stands to, to go in a distributed way, whether it's in roofs, parking lots, kind of smaller, uh, more scaling than e really building big infrastructure, you know, and that many other generation technology does need. Yeah, you know, you're, you're I think you're on to something there. Just this weekend, I was up in the Sierras driving along and uh, I know I was in the mountains and I noticed here's a helicopter flying above me. I thought that's odd, why is there a helicopter here? Then I noticed there's this big airplane, like very close to the ground. I thought that's odd, I wonder why there's a big airplane. It looks like rain clouds are coming in too. Next thing I knew, the road was closed. The high patrolman stopped me and turned me around because of the fires. Now, I'm not saying that fire was started by a power line because it wasn't. Um, it was the Markleyville fire. I don't think it was, but a lot of fires in California were in the fire season already. And uh, it's just so dry up here this year that power lines are a real issue. So anything that gets rid of a lot, you know, additional infrastructure is probably a good thing. 
Um, okay, I'll rant over. <laughs> Let's see what else we have here. Um, there's a comment here that getting local, state, public, and government support for green industry uh, with solutions into industries that historically were not green. I think they're saying that it's hard to do that. It's hard to get local support uh, for green industry. Greens, I think local support for solutions for industries that are not green. Um, so I guess the question here is, uh, you know, it reminds me San Francisco in particular has a program where in a lot, probably a lot of municipalities where they actually have their own clean tech or, or clean energy type promotional activities where they'll, they'll incentivize it and they'll put money into it. And they've actually, I have a client who actually took some investment dollars from the city of San Francisco to do, I think it was a biomass uh, product. Um, how about that? Is, is government coming along? Or are they supporting uh, these solutions? And is that even important? Or can we rely on technology and free market uh, to, to, you know, to help? Anybody? Oh, with the new government, there's certainly hope that they will do the right things. Um, we were a little bit in the woods there for a little while for reasons everybody knows. Um, but uh, I think we're back on the right track and the, the incentives are, are being set up to really tip the scales into the right direction. Okay, anybody else want to comment? If not, I'll keep going. Okay, if a pre-seed startup that has an improved method process of energy generation based on existing technology, can they get funding when IP will be difficult because they developed a novel use for existing energy technology? So I think what they're saying is that they've got uh, a novel use for existing energy technology, but it's an improved method. So I think maybe what they're saying is they don't have a lot of new IP, but they have a new method. Uh, how about that? Is that is that fundable? You know, I, I've been thinking about that. I saw that question a little earlier, and I've been thinking about it um, in the context of anything that we would do. I, I guess it, it, it's, it, it will have to depend. I mean, how hard is it to replicate that novel method of using that background or existing technology, I guess. How hard would it be? How you know? How hard would it be for anybody to just see it and be like, you know, do it in scale and you're done? Um, versus not, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, that, that's a, that's a hard that's a hard question to answer. It, it, I guess it would have to depend. I would break it down into three categories, right? Of different types of businesses. You have a service business that would utilize existing technology out there in the market to actually execute on something. It's not necessarily trivial uh, to actually go out there and, and, and execute on this and, and actually get it out into the market. Um, there are you know, pu purely product companies that will enable others to go ahead and, and solve some, some kind of a problem. But then there's technology enabled services that are kind of in the middle and they're valued you know, on a revenue multiple basis. At least they're valued kind of in the middle between a service company that might be a one or two X and a product company that might be valued 10 X or 20 X. It's somewhere in the middle. Uh, where you're using technology that maybe somebody else developed, but you're, you're really, uh, your approach to deploying the technology and, and delivering the service is your kind of know-how and your unique, um, your approach to the market. So uh, there's definitely room for that. Um, and those are oftentimes venture fundable businesses as well. Yeah, I think that was a good, I think that was a good framing and it really, it's going to come down to what's the business model that you're, thinking about applying to this core platform that may not have any um, unique technology, but you're using it in a new way. It's also, you know, that delicate dance that entrepreneurs do, which is if I share my idea with anyone, they're going to just go and try and do it themselves. So, you know, it's not unusual to see companies that have some type of trade secrets or, um, maybe there's some proprietary access to this existing technology or some, you know, tweak or adjustment that's being made in order to get it to work in this new application. But I think you have to either have some very specific expertise to be able to defend that thesis, um, or you have to like go out and build a whole business where someone will just say, oh, I'll just, I'll just acquire that instead of trying to go build it myself. Yeah. Well, as a lawyer, I want to add that I like IP, intellectual property protection. If you can patent it, patent early and often, uh, and you might be surprised what, what can be patented. And if you can't, then rely on trade secret, which does require that you keep you know, your, your process secret. 
Okay, we have a question from a student. Students always ask the best questions. So drilling down into the clean tech process, is there any one stage that is expected to see the most growth investment? Um, and then in the parenthetical, this is not stage, but I guess uh, different, different products, materials, components, integrations, infrastructure, systems and software or other. Uh, let's take the first part of that first. Um, because it, it bothers me that, that she said that early stage is not getting the money, that there's not enough money for early stage, since that's most of what I do. Do we expect to see a lot of growth in, in early stage investing, do you think, anybody? And by anybody, I mean Sarah. <laughs> I mean, if somebody comes to me and says they want to write me a $50 million check to help them do early stage investing, I'm not going to turn them away. Um, but you no, know, I, I just think it, it takes a very specific skill set to do it effectively. It's so hard because you're managing all these different types of risks. And so, um, you know, we, we believe our philosophy on how we build these businesses and we're very um, thesis driven. We don't invest on the momentum of a given sector or industry. Um, you know, if there's if, if you look across our portfolio, it's quite diverse. There's hardware, there's software, there's advanced materials, there's services, but we're not overweighted on any one dimension and that's pretty intentional. So, um, you know, there is a massive opportunity in early stage and there is a need for more capital. I think there are more really strong entrepreneurs, strong technology platforms that are out there that are just struggling to get those early, the capital to get through those early proof points. Um, and I think, uh, you know, my, my co-founder often uses the analogy, you know, what we are, what we like are looking to do is to invent the technology platforms of tomorrow. So when the cell phone was invented, that became the platform and everyone else just is building on top of that. They're putting apps on top of it. They're putting new functionality they can have in your pocket. And what we're talking about is, in some ways, inventing completely new platforms. We're not just building on top of solar and wind to do better O&M or better maintenance um, or more effective develop project development. We're thinking about how do you really commercialize entirely new platforms? And so um, it's hard, but there's a massive opportunity if you can unlock that. Anybody else? Okay, uh, thoughts from the panel on new sustainable propulsion, which means electric in terms of investments and market, especially related to marine and decarbonization. Um, I'm not even sure I know what that is. Does, does anybody here? I like the idea. I mean, anything that you can do to replace uh, diesel engines with something more efficient, which is kind of what it sounds to me, oh, okay. uh, would be something of interest to at least to a lot of the um, energy complex, at least on the RFS side, feels maybe, like. Maybe I can add a couple of things from, from EDFs, again, not the, necessarily the investment side of or at least venture capital investment side, but more at the group level, um, you know, using hydrogen for um, marine applications uh, is something that we've thought about uh, or people in the company have been thinking about regarding, um, you know, in, in comparison to commercial vehicles. I think fuel cells or, or hydrogen driven um, kind of long haul point to point, whether it's on trains or um, marine applications might be a good opportunity. Uh, they have the space, they can handle it. I mean, they have the infrastructure within the within the vehicle or the platform to, to do something like that. Um, but I can't really provide any useful information around you know, real numbers or investment appetite or anything like that. But um, that's the extent I know of it. I know for the you know uh, aviation applications, there's definitely a lot of interest to try to do something and you know, not to be judging. I, I don't know, are these real solutions? But I know there's many, many companies and, and technologies who are trying to do something to electrify aviation. Uh, so that's another application probably. Yeah, I, I could, I could uh, talk about this for probably an hour, but I'll try to keep it short. Um, you know, the opportunity in, in hydrogen for, for marine, uh, that's quite interesting because theoretically it could be free fuel you're able to process it fast enough, right? Just by sucking in the water. Um, the uh, as far as um, I, I haven't heard actually of, of of many applications there just yet. 
Uh, in aviation, there's definitely a consorted effort. Uh, the issue right now is with uh, the weight to power density, right? So theoretically, hydrogen is you know, very light um, and could be better than, than battery electric for aviation, but you have to take into account the full system weight, which is the storage, the cooling, all of that. Right now, that's pretty heavy still. Um, but it does make ultimately a lot of sense as, as soon as hydrogen can take a certain form. For example, it's being done kind of this in this goo form, uh, which is more stable. Um, that actually will, will pencil out to be quite interesting. And it actually solves the infrastructure question as well, because you can simply put hydrogen fueling at the airports, right? Airplanes fly airport to airport, whereas consumers are driving all over the place. And uh, infrastructure is definitely a factor. Um, that uh, you know, you can buy a Toyota Mirai and you can be stranded with it uh, pretty quickly because there's not that much out there. And it's kind of a chicken and egg. Do you put the infrastructure in for hydrogen fuel fueling, or do you have more vehicles on the road? You know, it, it's proven to be a chicken and egg with electric vehicles, and, and Tesla kind of uh, was able to kind of kamikaze their way into this market and and get to critical mass. But with hydrogen, we'll see. There's not as much motivation because there's the battery electric alternative. Um, the other thing that's, that's quite interesting is long haul trucking. That's where it really, really works well. And you're going to see uh, a lot of hydrogen fuel cell uh, long distance trucking, same principle. You're going from point to point, and then you have last mile delivery from those, those unload points where you can predictably put in infrastructure. So very relevant, and you're going to see that in the next half decade, you're going to see a lot more activity there. Okay, any other comments? So, you know, we, we broadcast all over the world, not broadcast, but I guess people are logging in on Zoom from all over the world uh, now that we can do this by Zoom. So we have people from parts of the world that previously have not been really exposed to, I guess, startup VC culture. So here's an interesting question. Uh, do you finance projects for impact investment in emerging markets? Uh, and, and there's a lot of dimensions to that. I mean, one is, you know, impact investment, then the other is, will you invest outside your, you know, where you happen to be sitting? Uh, anybody want to address that? I can see how there'd be probably a big need um, for, uh, for energy, you know, new energy solutions in some of the emerging markets. And maybe it's easier because they have less infrastructure to have to deal with, uh, that they have to replace. Sarah? So, so we'll invest in companies that have customer that are targeting customers or targeting emerging markets as a geography for their product or service. Um, and pretty much everything that we invest in is driving some form of impact. I guess we think of ourselves as impact investors in many ways, um, where it's not just the environmental bottom line, but it's also, you know, we're in it to make money because that's how we continue to exist. So um, we don't, we don't typically invest in, uh, we don't do project capital, but we'll do operating capital for the businesses. So I don't know if that answers that question, but. How about the rest of you? Will you invest in an emerging market or? I know you will, Osama, you invest, you invest all over the world, it sounds like. Not me. <laughs> so <laughs> I would say personally, I'm, I'm focused on North American. Uh, similar to Sarah, if there is application or, or customer base Beyond the U.S., that's definitely you. Again, we, we look for Europe mainly because this is where we are and believe we could help the most. Uh, but a resolution like we did um, prior to my time, invest in a, in a company along others that was working in the eastern side of Africa, um, off-grid solar. And through our investment with them, we helped them grow in the western side of Africa, the Francophone side, and, and like help them grow maybe in other regions where EDF was present to do similar things. So. The opportunity definitely is there, uh, but the company was based mostly here in the US. Um, uh, myself, you know, again, would, would definitely consider it, but within that realm of, again, is it a region or an area where we could help? Uh, can we offer something there for them? Uh, other than that, it's we're focused on the, at least US based startups um, for most of our work. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would add that innovation usually happens in developed markets and then that innovation is then applied to secondary and tertiary markets. Um, so as far as um, investing in a company that's inventing something new, uh, you might as well get on a plane and get to a more mature ecosystem where you will have, it'll be much easier to, to hire 
team members that are much more experienced, have uh, you know all sorts of capital thrown at you, um, that you're going after that market. But then at some point, you'll be able to apply things that have worked in other markets to developing markets, and that goes for energy. So a good example is, for example, uh, the e-commerce uh, market in Southeast Asia. Uh, essentially, it grew very, very quickly uh, on principles that were already proven in the U.S., you know, North America, and Europe. It was just a bunch of uh, smart founders and entrepreneurs that took that, you know, things that worked in other markets and applied it and regionalized it uh, for Southeast Asia and saw the opportunity there. But they didn't necessarily invent anything new there. So that would be the approach is, you know, you're talking to different audiences, you're talking to investors that would invest in in the innovation piece and in, in commercializing a new technology. And then you would you would have a, pro, a different profile investors that are looking particularly at applying uh, technologies and, and methods and techniques that worked elsewhere to a particular market where they have specialty in that market. They can help you open doors, etc. Government relations, you know, the world, unfortunately, is not a simple, you know, and, and a lot of people that uh, have never been have never done business in developing markets don't realize how, just how difficult it is. And, uh, you know, all the corruption and things they have to deal with, especially when we're talking about energy projects. These are not things that are done without government uh, participation. And I think on a personal note, I just came back from, from Egypt, where I'm from, and I have colleagues who are um, building businesses. Egypt is obviously a developing country. And, and actually, interestingly enough, EDF did um, do some investments in a local business, but the local element here is just beyond the most important thing. Me personally, investing in that company would have not provided them any value, even though I'm Egyptian. But having someone who is there, who knows the local market, who knows the regulations, and who could really help them gain customers much better than just me providing capital. It is very important. Okay. Um, how do you feel about investments in electric vertical takeoff and landing, electric helicopters and flying cars? They've been in the news lately, flying cars. We're finally seeing that happen. Uh, is that within any of your theses, anybody? I, I'm, I'm definitely involved in that. I, I'd like, I, I don't wanna hog the space, but I can, I can definitely talk about that for a second. Um, the interesting thing is that um, you know, there's a lot of money that's going into this air taxi business, which if you look at the numbers, uh, will really only maybe make it, let's say, half the cost of a helicopter flight right now. That is to say that it's not going to make it um, you know, accessible and, and build out the bottom of the pyramid and make it you know, 100 times more accessible for people. Um, so there's a lot of it, it's very presumptuous to think that that's going to be this, this market overnight. The other fa factor is the regulations. Right now, you know, if you want to operate an air taxi business, you really are within the constraints of helicopter flight the, uh, within, as far as FAA is concerned. So that means it's piloted. That means you're dealing with air traffic control, getting clearances, etc. The autonomous you know, air taxis that everybody shows, the vertical takeoff landing, etc. This is a decade away. Um, so there's a lot of capital going into it, presuming that this will be a market that develops at some point. Um, but, um, you know, that's very presumptuous and it's going to take a long, long time. Uh, it's better to invest in incremental improvements in current aviation, especially in U.S. and Europe, because uh, regulation takes a long, long time. You know, we're talking a decade to get GPS as a primary navigation device uh, in airplanes. Right? So uh, a lot of different factors there. Okay. Well, we are at the end of our time. I want to be respectful of the time of the panelists. I'm sorry for the attendees whose questions I did not get to. Um, you can, uh, if you want to email me and my information's in the chat, I'll forward your questions along to the panelists and uh, hopefully somebody will get back to you. Again, my name is Roger Royce. I'm a partner with Haynes and Boone in Palo Alto, California. This is Investment in Energy Tech. I want to thank you, our audience, for being here and thank you panelists for an awesome panel. And with that, we're going to conclude the program. Good evening, you guys. Thank you. See you next Thanks. time. Bye, everybody. Bye.